Welcome, fellow beekeepers. This is Jamie Walters, OSBA Maumee Valley Director and Newsletter Editor. I'm pleased to announce OSBA's new live webinar training series. Live sessions will be recorded on the second and fourth Sunday of each month at 7 p.m. through Zoom conference call. You're welcome to attend by reserving a spot on OSBA's Facebook page or by sending an email to editor at ohiostatebeekeepers.org. Each training session will be recorded and posted on the following Sunday on Ohio State Beekeepers' new YouTube channel. You can find it at Ohio State Beekeepers Association. You're welcome to subscribe and be sure to click the bell to be alerted each time we upload a new video. Each month's speaker and presentation will be posted on our Facebook page by direct emails that will go out to registered and paid members and our website at ohiostatebeekeepers.org. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at editor at ohiostatebeekeepers.org. And now, on to our previously recorded session. Spring and summer splits. And my granddaughter's name is Katie, so that's how I get the Katie's Bees and Honey. And this is just going over the basics. If you have any questions, please type that in or save them to the end and we'll get on to, this, on to the program. For anybody that does not know me, I'm Jamie Walters. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but that's what I started it. I started with a Defiance, Defiance Master Gardener about 14, 15 years ago. Um, all the way around the outside is what I've done. I was the 2017 Beekeeper of the Year, run the Propus Award. My day job is computers, IT, and broadcasting, and I work for Nationwide, I work for Town and & Country, and I just bought two offices for each in our block. My big claim to fame and my, the be my best thing that I've done in my life so far is we started the Pollinator Sanctuary and Training Facility of Defiance County, and we won a national award in Las Vegas. It's the NACO Award, and they take all the counties throughout the entire United States, and we won first place in agriculture. So we've done a lot of good things, and I went and put ninety percent of that is Dwight Wilson, who taught me beekeeping, and I want to pass it on to other beekeepers. AccuWeather is going to tell you everything that's going on with your beehive. Just like we're watching this week, here's the twelfth of this month. I just pulled this down. All week it's supposed to be cold and wet. We have a little bit of rain. The overnights are going to be frozen, so the bees are not going to be out foraging. So if you have bees and they're starting to build up, what can you do? One-to-one -one sugar water, put on a little piece of fondant, um, put on some um, pollen patty. Let them to run have some resources inside that colony because they're not gonna be able to get out and forage. They're gonna be clustered up. Anything under 50 degrees, they're gonna be clustered inside the hive. They might be able to move around a little bit, but the overnights, as you see, 35, 34, 33. So they're not gonna be doing it too much. If it's a small colony that you have, you've just done a split, maybe last week, I've heard a lot of people talk about splits last week, make sure you're feeding them and getting these girls through. I also have a dis, excuse me, which way, I did an accident, my fault. I actually have a disclaimer on top of that. Bees will be bees. There's some bees, of, breeds of bees that'll come out, people say, oh, it's 30 some odd degrees, I see my bee girls come out and fly back in. Every bee is going to be different, but on the, on the overall, we're, you need to know what's going on with your bees. Another real good tool, GDD. It's Ohio State's, Ohio State's Growing Degree Days. This is telling you what's in bloom. You can go to that website, www.oardc.ohiostate.edu, GDD. What you do is you type in your zip code. For me, it's 43512. You can change, it's on today's date. When I click it in, it's telling me that the silver maples have already went by. Red maples are done, speckled alders there. I'm sitting at a 54. The score is if it's over 50 degrees for eight hours, you'll get so many points. If it's over 50, say it's in 60, 65, you could jump five or six or 10 points in one day. If you have hot days, three, four days in a row and hot nights, it might jump a hundred points. And it's telling me what's in bloom helping me know when my nectar flow is gonna start. So I know right around red maples, once red maples kick in, the dandelions are kicking in. When you go home every day, you go home or to your apiaries, look and see what's in bloom. 
are the roadside ditches? Do you have skunk cabbage and do you have dandelions and do you have, um, let's say, eastern red buds and, and things like that in bloom? Um, willows will be in bloom right now. So this is telling me what's indicating my nectar flow in my area and we have a huge difference between Northwest Ohio and North all the way down to Cincinnati who might be, um, last I looked at those, they were at 165. So their, their nectar flow had already started. They're already into doing splits and having swarms. We're gonna talk about Varroa real quick. Varroa for me, I'm gonna jump on a little bit of a soapbox on this. I want you to take alcohol and, and even though the alcohol is gonna be very hard with all this COVID-19 going on, windshield wiper fluid. It's 99 cents a container, it's gonna do the same things. And the reason I say alcohol, We've all seen how the powdered sugar rolls are. Um, I've been an inspector for four years now. The powdered sugar, there's tens of different, tons of different ways to turn on and do a sugar, sugar shake. We, why do we do it? We do it because we don't want to kill our bees. We don't want it to run and you want to save those 300 bees. I'm going to ask you this. You're taking a sample, just like going to the doctor's appointment every month, and you're just getting a checkup. You're just checking the health and the maintenance of your bees. That 300 bees, that queen is laying 1,500 to 2,000 eggs every day. More than that is dying every day. You're taking a sample of 300 bees to see the health conditions of those bees. You don't go into the doctors and ask for a steroid shot and a Z-pack and zithromycin. You, the bees, you don't need to be hitting your bees with hard chemicals or manipulating them or doing things if you, they don't need it. So what you're going to do on a monthly service, you're going to turn around and check those bees starting in May, June and you're gonna monitor every month. ODA and the USDA have set a recommendation of nine mites per 300. That's a half a cup. And you're gonna take that half a cup of bees from open brood, from older larvae, that when the nurse bees are walking around, you're gonna take that frame, you're gonna check for the queen first, thump it down into the bottom of a container, and you're gonna turn around and scoop up a half a cup of bees because the nurse bees are not gonna fly. The ones that are flying out are your foragers. They're gonna go back to the colony and you're gonna turn around and take that and do an alcohol wash. I'm gonna say, I'm not, I'm not trying to promote the easy check, but it is the easier way to check your, your mite count. You can do this with a mason jar, with a number eight screen on the top. You can do it old school. This is, I hate to say, absolute buy this, but if you have the extra $20, buy it. What it does is when you put in, you put about a quarter of a cup underneath of alcohol or windshield wiper fluid, Put in your half a cup of bees, shake this in your ABCs twice. Give it time for those out for those mites to dislodge from the bees. Shake it up vigorously, not real nice and slow, vigorously. When you turn around and do that, on the bottom of this, when you hold it up to the light, here's what you're going to see. All I did is take those mites, I poured them into a container so I could take a picture of it. This, as an inspector, I went out. This is one gentleman's hives in late September. There's 162 mites per 300. The hives were crashing, there was snotty brood, there was nothing left, the queen was trying to outlay. All the bees, I took a toothpick and was pop, popping the young larvae out, or excuse me, the young pupae out. None of them had wings, they all had deformed wing virus or K wing. This is what you wanna see off to the right hand side. This even is kinda high to me because I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I even I have seven at that point, I need to be thinking about treating my bees or doing something to intercede to keep my mite count down. The thing to do is Ohio, um, Ohio honey, honeybee, honey, or honeybee Health Coalition, excuse me. You go to the website, it actually has a, a sheet where you can monitor every month and it's asking you the questions of what you need to do. Honeybee Health Coalition book, you can also go to the website and download the PDF. Ohio State Beekeepers and the Welcome Kits, and this year that we sent out, they also sent that booklet out. Please read and try to understand what goes on. It, tell, it talks everything from Apivar, Apistan, Hopguard, drone comb, the green drone comb, um, screen bottom boards, all the things in the, in the kill rate or what the best rate is. There's nothing out there that's 100% kill, but it's all gonna show you the PPE, personal protection? Does it require a respirator? Does it require nitro gloves? What's the efficacy or kill rate of that? So if you understand this 
And even if you don't, highlight it, make some notes in it, talk to your club, every micro environment across Ohio, the United States, everybody's gonna have different heat, cold, warm, different brood seasons, different buildups, different um, dearths. So you want to turn around, talk to your people and your club, talk to your officers, talk to your county inspector and ask why you're doing different things and what's the best recommendation and what you want to do. You don't want to put on Apivar, Apistan if you're going to have honey that you're going to consume. You'll want to do something else. And everything has a heat temperature difference, what the kill rate was. So you need to understand that. That is my best recommendation, so I'll step off my soapbox. And here's some other ones. Evaluate and record this every month so you'll know exactly what you have going on. We all, every one of us, want healthy bees. We want to be able to make honey. And there's not, and there's no one that can kind of bail against me on this. You cannot raise queens on sick bees. You cannot have honey on sick bees. I cannot make splits. I cannot have anything that's going to run prolificate my bees if they have no wings, they're sick, and they're dying. The integrated pest management is just that. What I'm doing is I'm taking samples to turn around and follow the labels on the chemical or anything else. If it says nitro gloves, don't just wear your just wear gloves or leather gloves because the chemical will soak in and give you chemical burns. All of these, I cannot say, if I wrote a book and said, this is exactly what you have to do, I'd be a millionaire. But on this, you need to understand the directions. You need to understand the timing if you're going to use drones. Oxylic, you can't use when they have brood. Might away quick strips have an efficacy. Apistan and everything else. But please read the directions. On to buying nukes. And we're all going to get rid of the seasons right around the corner. Buying nukes purchased from a reputable dealer. Know that they have a queen in it. They have brood, they have honey, and everything that's inside. Ask to see the thing inside. So, and ask if they, if you're, if you have a questions, talk to people in your club and say, hey, has this person sold good nukes before? This is what you want to see in a nuke. You want to see tons of bees. Pull the frames up and see what's going on. That way you know what you're getting because $170 for every nuke and the price keeps going up every year, is starting to get a little pricey. So just to run a buyer beware, buy it from people that you know and people that can stand up and say, yes, they sell good nukes. When you're installing your nukes, and this is in an eight frame or 10 frame, once you get your nuke, you're gonna turn around and buy it from a dealer and the dealer's gonna say, these are the days that you're, you can pick up that nuke. When you pick up that nuke, take your B gear with you. Don't just show up in jeans or anything else. Know that when you do that that day, don't have the dealer or yourself take that nuke, stick it in your truck and go drive around and go get groceries or go drive around. Get your nuke, take them back, get them installed right off the bat because now you have thousands of bees inside that box. They're gonna overheat in the back of an open truck, in the back of a pickup truck, a trailer, the trunk's open a little bit. You can wear your bee suit home and put them in the back seat, right in the passenger seat right with you. When you're gonna take this out, those five frames are gonna stay in this same formation because in this nuke right now, in all the nukes that are around in Ohio and everywhere else, that queen and that brood's in the dead center and she's growing. When I take this out to put this in my hive, number one, I want my hive, the hive that you're gonna put this into, you want it painted, done, set up, everything around the grounds, all to run taken care of, and everything set up before you even go buy your nuke, so no, that most nukes by the end of April and beginning of May, people are gonna start calling you and say your nukes are ready. So have everything ready. Once I get it home, I'm gonna open up the top. I'm gonna to set this right beside my old, my hive that I wanna put it into, and I'm gonna take out the first frame. First frame is either gonna be, you can look at this at one, two, three, four, five, or five, four, three, two, one. When you take out the first frame, you're gonna take that out with your hive tool, nice and slow. You're gonna put it in here and you're gonna slide it into the open gap and then slide it up against that foundation frame. Same way with this. If you can get two of them at a time, that's even better. But if you're not, if you're not secure in it, take one at a time. For this instance, we're gonna take two. I'm gonna slide them in here into the gap and slide them slowly over to the other frame. Same way with the last two. Pull them out, slide them into the gap, and slide it over to the other. So it's in the same formation. You'll see one, two, three, four, five. That way the brood is all in the center. 
The queen's tucked right nice inside. They have honey and pollen to the outside around the top a little bit, and you've just done a complete transfer. Now that I've transferred my bees over, then I'm gonna take a frame of foundation, put it back in, into the gap, slide it over, same way with the last, and slide that over. When you slide these in, then take your hive tool on the outside and press everything together real nice and slow. Don't get rammy, put it back together, put your inner cover on top, put your telescoping on top, and then we'll talk about feeding. When you, when you do that, this is a deep, it's the same way with a medium, and, and on forth and on forth after that. With a package, there's two different ways to do this. There's many other ways. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but this is the easiest. If you're gonna transfer to eight or 10 frame equipment, take your bees, depending on the how cold it is, don't spray them with sugar water, with sugar water and soak these girls down if it's already 40 degrees outside. But if it's a little bit warmer, you can spray them down just a little bit, remove this top piece of wood, and then you're gonna have a feeding can, and then you'll have a little piece of tape here that has a wire that has the queen suspended that these girls are clustered around to keep that queen nice and warm. What you're gonna do is you're gonna pop the top. You're gonna to have your hive here already set up on a hive stand, everything ready to go, your frames in hand, everything's around you so you don't have to open this up, go back to the garage or anything else. When you're picking up packages, these, this package does not have any brood, any honey, any resources in it. It is a package of bees, either a two or three pound container with a queen and that's all it is. So when you're starting out as a newbie, if you're gonna start out, here's your frames of foundation. What you're gonna do is you're gonna place these in between. You're gonna take the queen out, remove the pack two or three days, or excuse me, we'll go through the steps here. So when we pull this can out, we're gonna open this up, thump the container so all the bees drop to the bottom. You're gonna pull out the feeder can and you're gonna take the queen out and then take this chunk of wood and cover the hole back up. You're gonna take that queen, you're gonna suspend her wrap the wire around the top or put a thumbtack in it and you want the screen you want to check the queen make sure she's moving around make sure she's healthy the screen that is on that queen cage you're going to want that have that so the bees can feed her you want to see it put it between the gaps so you can see that queen running around if you take that screen and put it up against the foundation there will be no way for the bees to feed that queen so as i suspend her in between then i'm going to take this entire box and I'm gonna place it right inside with her. This is one method only. If you put it inside, the bees will come out, they'll come over and cluster over the queen, then you can put a top on, and then we'll talk about feeding here in just a little bit. The other way to do this is to put all frames of foundation across, take the, take the, new, or the package, and actually shake them on top. So you're gonna shake all the bees out of this container and shake them on top of the queen. They'll cluster up around her and you're good to go. If you're gonna pick this method where you drop the box in so you're not being as aggressive or shaking the bees into the box, what you're gonna do is you're gonna remove, the, remove this after two or three days. If you leave this box in after the third or fourth or sixth day and you forget about it for a week, the bees are gonna completely put um, burr comb and they're gonna glue this thing inside your box. On the third day maximum, remember third day maximum, you're gonna release, you're gonna tear around and release that queen out. They should have chewed through the candy by then, but there's a little cork. When you try and move this queen over, pop that little cork off. If they have not chewed through this after the third day, you're gonna turn around, take that, lay it on the top bars, take a toothpick or the edge of your hive tool, pop the pop the rest of the candy out, she'll crawl down inside, and then you can take it away. If they if they don't feed her or get through that candy and it's five or six or seven days, she's gonna to start to shrink in size or she can die. Inspections. For those of you that already have bees, well, this is for the other side. When you're walking up to your hive, I wanna see bees moving around. I wanna see a nice cluster of bees. I wanna see a reduced entrance because it's cold right now. So everything, you're, you have everything ready. Do I need to maintain this? Is my hive stand broken? Do I need to turn on and switch boxes out? There's a lot of the things you can do just from the outside walking up to your hive. On the inside, once I open that inside up, do I have excess of moisture in the top? Do I already have hive beetles that overwintered in my colony? Because we did not have a hard winter this year, 
I'm seeing a lot of people with hive beetle problems already. Um, the colony strength, have they starved out? Are they all at the top? Do they have K-wing, deformed wing? Is there mold growing inside? Do they have enough feed? Those are a lot of the things you're gonna be multitasking. Remember, please take notes. When you're taking notes and you're taking pictures and things like that, if you need help from a club officer a, or, or your county inspector, all the way up to Barb Bletcher or even higher, you want to run, have good notes so you can say accurate information and get the right answers every time. You're outside. What does a healthy hive look like? This is a healthy hive. I want to see bees fanning. I want to see bees hanging out. I want to see pollen coming inside. This is what you're going to see now. Take the time to take a little stand, a bucket, anything. Sit down, not in the front, in, in the front entrance, but sit off the side and watch your girls in the activity. If you have two hives and one is belching bees in and out, it's a nice warm day and they're really, really active, and the other one has nothing going on and you see a few bees, those should be signs in your head that say, I need to open that up. This is not a full hive inspection. This is only looking from the outside. So when you do this, you're just seeing the health of them. If both of them are acting equally, or you go to a club meeting and they have an apiary that you can turn on and go to, compare yours to what's going on. Don't be afraid of taking some pictures and know what a healthy hive is doing. Frame identification. What does a healthy hive look like? Here off to the left, we have pollen, bright yellow. We have a little bit of purple, which could be some dead nettle. We have all kinds of pollen on the outside ring. I even have a little bit of capped honey above that. Then we have a, a ring of, of eggs, young larvae, old larvae, capped larvae. Everybody has nice wings. There's nice white creamy brood. Every time you open up your hive, if you see two solid frames or two good frames of brood, it's all nice, wet, white, and creamy. You have healthy brood. Compared to here to the right, we have chalk brood problem. In the springtime, it's going to be wet. If, you're, if your hives are in the woods, there's not enough air circulation, you could have problems with chalk brood. Down below, this is not healthy brood. We have yellow, sunken, twisted, melted, larvae, um, sunken cappings. This is, a, this is a series of European fowl brood, but I want you to see the difference. Off to the left, nice, wet, and creamy, and white, pearly white. Off to the side here, yellow, brown, and you're starting to see problems. If you're in your hives, the best thing to do for you is to be in your hives at least every week, week and a half. If you start to see little problems like this, you could just take those frames out and save the colony. If you're not in your bees for a month, a month and a half, or something happened, then all of a sudden, every frame is going to look like this and the colony is going to collapse. Talk to your people in your club. In Northwest Ohio, we have BB sitters. And actually, I did say that correctly, BB sitters. If I'm going to be gone away for a while, other people in the club will, 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 will wear nitro gloves and come over and BB sit or check on my eyes for me. Talk to your club and see if you can turn on set something up like that. A pattern. A brood pattern for a good laying queen should be consistent. So here off to the left is a nice queen. She's laid this nice solid pattern. There's a couple heater holes here and there where they actually, the, the bees will go down, put their heads in, gyrate and actually warm this brood area up. This is what I wanna see in a queen. I wanna see something that's consistent. Even at that, this was about the same time last year. I think this was in May but you'll see the drone area, they're much raised up a little bit larger, larger cells. They look like little 22 shells. I have cap honey over the top. The only thing when this one's missing was a little, um, little brood area or a little rim of pollen. But there's nice cappings on the top. Everything looks good. Look at my bees. I look at the brood pattern. This is what I wanna see. Off to the right, you'll see a shotgun pattern. This could be disease. This could be the queen that's failing. She's running out of, of sperm. I have a little tiny colony. They're not able to take care of the whole thing. When people say shotgun pattern or failing queen, this queen, even though you call her Betsy and you love her to death, off with her head, combine her with another hive, or to run and get another queen from a, from a queen uh, a breeder and to run try to save this colony. 
if this is all I had as far as a colony, this little tiny handful of bees, sometimes it's just easier to shake all the bees out, freeze this frame, then I would throw it away, make sure there's not a pest or disease into it. Even talk to a, a, an inspector or somebody in your club and say, take a picture of it and say, what do you think is going on? And tell them the facts that you've done in your journal. This is what I want to see all the time. Healthy bees equal clean, white, healthy brood. As you see here, I always see an egg. I see young larvae, nice, wet, and creamy, just bathing and eating into a bath of royal jelly. And then I see that whole thing of the, of the, of the babies from the eggs, the young larvae, the old larvae, the cat brood, but everything's nice, pearly, white, and creamy. Then we have tons of resources coming in, and I know I have tons of good nurse bees and tons of forage because they're regurgitating Olympic-sized pools of royal jelly. These girls, there's no nutrient problems with this because they have tons of food inside right now. So this is what you want to see. If you ever see any other color, any other problems, this is the time to ask questions and get on top of it as soon as possible. Two things you can do every time you go inside your hive is look at the eggs in that transition between the eggs and the larvae. You'll know enough if there's enough forage out there. If you see, this is called dry brood, is when the eggs actually drop and there's little tiny bit of royal jelly. Compare it to the right, where we see copious amounts of royal jelly. That means there's tons of forage coming in. You could also see this in August when we have the dearth. And for those of you who don't know what the dearth is, that's when everything starts to dry up. There's no more pollen sources, no more nectar sources, and the bees will actually eat the young or cannibalize the drones in the brood. They'll, they'll eat the heads off and they'll car cart the body out the front. That means the hive is actually starting to recede or, or go backwards because there's not enough forage for them to grow. So when you pull up your brood, I can see eggs, the eggs that are standing up, that means the queen laid that egg within the last 24 hours. You don't have to see the queen every time you open up the colony. It's nice if, if you wanna get in practice in that, kind of look around, but if your hive starts to get active and you hear that roar and the bees are getting a little aggressive, put it back together, but start looking at your brood and see if you have wet brood or dry brood. This is wet, this is, or excuse me, this is dry, this is wet. When we feed, and a way to do that, if you start to see dry brood or you have tons of foundation, beginning beekeepers, you're gonna to have tons of foundation because you just got into bees. You don't have the drone comb. You don't have all the resources that an older experienced beekeeper has that has kept bees three and four years. It's also the same for older beekeepers when you're, I'm making up nukes. The oldest beekeeper, every person, you're throwing away old frames that are brown, that are um, hard and combed. You want to turn around and rotate those things out. A way to turn around and feed your bees, everybody, if you're starting out from beginning or you turn around and want to supplement that feed, is to turn around and put on feeders. This is a top hive or top feeder. You can pour in, they make them from uh, nukes that'll hold about a gallon and a half to the full size that'll hold about two and a half gallons. What you're gonna do is set that on top of your hive. The bees have come up through the middle. These slats will float. And as the bees drink, the slats just drop down. You can refill it. That's a, um, about $30, $40, depending on, on, on who you get it from. The easiest way is just a mason jar. Take a mason jar. You have your beehive down below with your five frames. If you start with a package or with a nuke or your package right underneath, and you're going to turn around put this mason jar right on top. We mix it up one to one. You draw and mix it up. Draw and it's not a scientific. It's one, one scoop of sugar to one scoop of water. And you're going to mix that up in a hot water and you're going to turn and warm that up enough that it just turn and solidify or excuse me, it liquefies and you can't see the sugar anymore. So it just, it, it gets sucked into it. You're going to mix this up and you're going to take a paneling nail or a drywall nail and you're going to beat about eight holes in the top of this lid. And what that's going to do, it's going to create a vacuum. So after you do this, make one or two of them up, tap in your paneling nails into the top, make up two containers. One container you're going to take out to the bees. The other one you're going to put a little, little Ziploc or something over the top so it's ready to go next time you need it. When you go out, 
take this out to your bee yard, put on your veil because it'll be that one girl that'll sit down here at the top entrance. You're gonna open up the telescoping cover and she's gonna come out and nail you. Please put on your veils. So when I wanna go out and feed, if you're gonna try and need drone comb or you need something that's gonna turn around and stimulate these girls, you're gonna take the jar out. You're gonna turn around, just before you take it out, you're gonna flip it over and it's gonna pour profusely for the first couple seconds and then it's gonna stop. Then it's gonna drip just a little bit. That way what's happening is the jar inside with the liquid is pulling a vacuum. Then you can set that on the top and the slot or there's actually circles on, depends on the dealer and depends on the inner cover. Leave a little bit of a gap so the bees can still get out. And what's gonna happen is the house bees and the foragers, if it's cold and wet and, and nasty for five days in a row, they can come up underneath here. The heat's coming out of the center at 92, 94 degrees. It's keeping this warm and the girls can drink right here, stimulate the nurse bees and produce wax. So they can turn around and start drilling out wax a little bit better for you. So take a, I, I, I tell people to take a highlighter or take a black felt, felt, or black felt marker and mark that every two or three days. As this thing starts to get empty, go ahead and grab the other jar, put on your veil, go out and switch the containers over. Man Lake, Dayton, they also build little risers that sit up and it'll hold four of these, four quarts right on the top. Then you're gonna take it empty deep, put on the outside of this and cover this up and put on your telescoping top. You're feeding your bees right above the brood area or right above the colony. I do not like boardman feeders that the bees have to break the cluster to go out to the front entrance because if it's cold and they're clustered up, they're not going to break and they're going to turn on, not go out to that boardman feeder. Plus a boardman feeder, you're actually stimulating everything else. Wasps, hornets, bumblebees, mice, and things to turn on, eat off the front. And you can entice robbing if there's a lot of stronger hives in the area. This way, the feed is directly above the colony. They can come up and eat. If you're going to feed one, feed them all. Same way, there's another method of a Ziploc bag. What you're going to do is you're going to take a Ziploc bag of sugar water, get the freezer type that has a nice tight seal, take an X-Acto blade and cut a couple slits in the top. And the next time you go out there, they're just going to go up in the slits. They're going to stick their tongues inside. And the next thing you know, that bag's going to be absolutely flat. But it's another way, depending on the resources you have, if you have a few mason jars around, that's a way to do it. If you want to put some money out, you turn on do the top feeder or Ziploc bags and do it that way. Feeding your nuke or your package. This is what I talk about dire feeding directly above your, your feeders. So I have a nuke. So now I have a queen. I have brood. I have larvae. I have foragers, house bees, honey, nectar. I have everything in the inside to get this colony. So I'm starting off with a little bit bigger process about a month ahead of what these, uh, the, the package is. So when I do this, I'm going to turn around, put that empty box on top. And I'm going to place, you could put on a one gallon pickle jar if you wanted to, a quart, a pint, anything that has heavy walls on it or glass or hard plastic. If you use anything like a milk jug or anything that's soft, what's going to happen? It's going to create that vacuum. It's going to suck the sides in and then it's going to release. And then it's going to chug real slow back and forth. And it's going to take this entire contents of this container and pour it straight down through the colony and kill everything. And wet bees are dead bees. So I could use a pint, a quart. I use a one gallon pickle jar from Schisler Pickle. I buy them by the case and then turn on do it that way. Same way with a package. A package, I'm going to turn on take a quart container. If I have some quarts laying around, I can do it this way. They're going to go up and be able to feed directly off of this. In this case, if it's a package, they have no kitchen in there. So imagine walking into your kitchen with no kitchen cupboards, no, nothing to around, put a pantry or anything put away. These bees have got to turn around and take this sugar water. If they're trapped inside, if it's cold, wet, and rainy, they've got to convert that, make the nurse bees lactate wax, actually start drawing the wax out in this center area. And then once the comb is pulled out, then they can start putting in, the queen can lay eggs. Then they can put in some pollen if they need to, but they're going to build up a lot slower. This is somebody who's brand new to beekeeping and has no drone comb. This is why in a package, it's gonna set you back a little bit further. This is what we all crave and want. If we had thousands of frames of this, you're all ready to go. 
But as a newbie, even a senior beekeeper, when we put in a frame of foundation, either real wax or perco plastic or any of the other dealers like that, there's nothing for these bees to draw on. There's nothing for them to put it away or start storing things. So I need to turn on stimulate those bees, either a big strong colony, feeders, young brood, put in frames of brood or emerging brood so they, the young nurse bees can lactate wax. And this is my prize, this nice drawn out comb, nice white and creamy. Now the bees can put things away, store things up. The queen can lay, have everything in there. That is my goal. Is there a price on drawn comb? Absolutely not. Because it takes 10 pounds of honey to make one pound of wax, plus an entire workforce of young lactating um, nurse bees to draw and draw all this wax out to do this. Remember, they have eight or eight platelets, four on each side that they're lactating wax from. It takes a huge workforce to draw this out. If the nectar's already flowing and everything the nectar flows on, you can turn on and let it, the bees be bees and let them do it that way. If you want to help them out, put on a feeder. Oh, my fault. So your buildup. I talk, when I talk to people, I talk gaps of bees. And when we talk gaps of bees, what we're talking about is this in a 10 frame box, you'll actually have 11 gaps. And if you look from the top, we're, taking, we're looking at gaps down through the top of this. In, a nine, in an eight frame box, you're talking eight gap or nine gaps. So as these bees build up, I wanna, be around, I wanna get to them and react with them when this box gets 80 to 90% full. If not, then they get into swarm season or then they start getting into swarm mode and then they're gonna to wanna to take off on us. So if I have a feeder on the top, that's a way to stimulate them. This colony is gonna grow. When I get to this point now in this 10 frame box, I have everything drawn out in a 10 frame box. The drawback to it is they might not go to this outside and you can see this in the white. So they might not get to the outside. Sometimes in a 10 frame box, you can pull this up, flip it around, slide it back in. If the colony gets to this size, I wanna be able to put on another box. That means it's already painted. The frames are built, it's sitting in a garage, honey house or shed, and it's ready to put on the bees. If you get to this point and you have to call the dealer or go ahead and put it together, it might be too late. So I call this the pyramid style. I've heard it called different things. So here's my colony, it's actually starting to build up. I put on the feeder and my colony is gonna to start to grow, either a nuke or a package. As this thing gets to that 70, 80%, a way to make these bees, I've seen too many times where this colony sits here, the person takes a full box of foundation, sets it on the top, and the bees still swarm on them. This is a way of actually, the most important thing to bees is the brood. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take right in the center of that colony, you're not going to pull the center frame up by itself. You're going to pull the outside frames and work over. Always pull the outside frame first. Scoot these over. Find that middle frame. Put in a frame of foundation. Take out the frame of nurse or of brood, young brood. Put that in the top. Put in a frame of foundation. Put this back together. Put this box on top. Now the bees are going to turn around and want to cover this brood. The nurse bees in the center on this foundation are going to want to draw that out. The nurse bees that are up here are gonna to wanna to drill out these outsides. Now this colony is gonna grow. Now there's a reason for them to get into that, cross that gap and get into that second box. And if all else, if you want to, you can put on a feeder on the top of it and actually stimulate them to help them draw out more wax. If we get into the nectar flow, stop after you're done, after they get into the second box, then stop feeding because if you're going to turn on do this for honey and you want to sell this honey and you're feeding them, you're only selling sugar water, processed sugar water. So when the colony's here, that little area on the bottom, it's always going to be for the foragers bringing in um, pollen. The top, they're going to turn on put in the honey dome across the top of this. And here's my colony and plenty of area for the queen to lay, have brood, have everything that's going on. Then later in the year, this box gets completely full. You can turn on, put on your third, your fourth, your fifth, sixth box, depending on your season, your skills, and what the nectar flow is going on. This is what we all want to see. 
If we all had boxes of bees like that, that's what you want to see. The population, a nice buildup, colony strength, the nectar flow, and it's pouring on and on. The drawback to this is queen cups. Everybody, if you imagine a coffee cup flipped upside down, in your coffee cups, all breeds of bees will have cups inside your colonies. You can tear them down and they're gonna put them right back in. There's nothing wrong with having the cups. The problem is, is when this colony gets 80, 90%. So when I talk gaps of bees, you can see every gap in this 10 frame box is completely filled. So 11 gaps are filled. This colony is probably because I see burr comb in the center. This colony is already set up to swarm and they're getting ready for swarm season and then they might even have queen cells inside. So a way to check that is when you pull up frames, you're always gonna have a honey dome. If all of a sudden you go in and there's in the center of this and you actually see the, here's the eggs and the brood and the larvae and you see a little bit of pollen over the top. If all of a sudden the nectar keeps coming down and closing off this queen area that she's laying and now it, you have more nectar coming in, they're running out of room, they're jammed up. Or you open up the frame and it's, now there's no queen area for the queen to lay. The whole entire thing is backfilled with nectar and pollen. They're actually in swarm mode at that point. Like I showed on the cups, this would be like taking a coffee cup and flipping it over. And this is where the queen, the queen, the old queen is gonna lay eggs if they get into swarm mode. There is nothing wrong with having queen cups. You'll have queen cups on the front. Sometimes they'll eat out the edge and they'll turn around and put them on the side. What to do is take that frame, put it, put the sun over your shoulder, so the sun's shining over your shoulder, take the frame, tilt it up, and look down inside the hole or the, the end port of this. If it's empty or polished and you don't see an egg or any royal jelly, you're still fine. But make sure you get another box on top of that colony, break them up, checkerboard, there's other things you can do and relieve the stress of that congestion. If you start to see that queen cup that's starting to get pulled down and now it's starting to get elongated like a raw peanut. And for the older generation here, you know what a raw peanut looks like. Here's a raw peanut. Now, if he starts to pull it out and I tilt that, tilt that frame and I look down inside and I see royal jelly in a larvae, now I know that I'm already, she, the queen's already uh, swarmed or she's in swarm mode. This is the time I would go through that entire hive and find every one of these queen cells. If I see it at this point, I look at my notes. The colony was completely filled. It had nine gaps of bees and 11 gap box or a 10 frame box. If I see that going on, if you find the queen at that point and if she, it was cold weather, she stayed there, and all of a sudden you find the queen, take that old queen and make a split at that point. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. If I open up that box and I look at my notes and there was nine gaps of bees and now I got into the box and now I find larvae, I find royal jelly in all these cups and half the workforce, it's like somebody took half of your bees away, they've already swarmed on you. So at that point, if you start to see the peanuts getting lengthwise this way, do not cut those swarm cells out because this is the queen that's gonna save your colony or queens in multiple, multiple uh, cells that are gonna save that colony and are gonna be your next queen. If you took a hive tool and cut all these queen cells out and half your workforce was gone, now you have to turn around and find somebody to turn around and buy a queen from. If you look on, the, on this one, the end of it is capped over. That's on nine day or on day nine and 10. That means I have a full pupae. She's getting into the pupal stage at that point, and she's going to be ready to emerge on the 16th day. At that point, if I seen this, you weren't in your bees for two weeks, and all of this is going on in the last 15 days, she could be at the point where this starts to thin out in the tip, and she's going to get ready to emerge. Put it back together. If you don't know what you're doing, talk to your club officers or your best resort first. Talk to a senior beekeeper, your mentors. County, county inspectors can help you out, but leave that in there, slide it back together. If you have some skills, if I seen three different frames and each one had a large size peanut like this, I could make, at that point, it's my decision, I could make three splits. 
but the more splits you make, you're gonna cut back on your honey production. You've already lost the old queen at this point, and it's gonna to have to recoup. By the time she turn on emerges, makes a mating flight, comes back, you're out a month and a half. So if the nectar flow is over in that month and a half, now you're behind the eight ball. If you open up the frame, you pull it up, and all of a sudden this beautiful little chiseled out hole, think of an old tin can or an old soup can where you had to take the hand and just can crank the top open, or, or do, the hand, do the hand crank. If the end of this is cut completely open, that old virgin or the young virgin queen is now running around. This one has emerged. That means she's running around, she's piping, making noise, and this one has not. But this one, if you see the fine light one, or line in it, this one's getting ready to emerge. If one queen emerges, she'll chew the side of this out and kill her sister off. If two of them emerge at the same time, they're gonna to fight to the death and one will survive. If there's multiple cells, they're all gonna fight or they're all gonna to try to leave and try to get away. But that virgin queen's gonna run around and she's gonna pipe. She's gonna to try to spread her QMP as quick as possible to make this her colony. Nukes. So if you do decide to play to run do nukes, you can make as many splits as you want, but you're gonna take care of them and you need to take care of them more often. Once a week, get in there and see what's going on because they're going to build up a little bit faster because it's a smaller space. With nukes, and the books always tell you for two solid colonies that you have, two full-size colonies, you should have at least one nuke. The reason and the value point in this is that you have a queen you already have. So all you'd have to do is take that queen, put her in a cage, introduce her, so you have a queen on hand. So in your full-size colony, say your colony A, all of a sudden it becomes a laying worker. You crush the queen by accident. Something happened, she swarmed. Now in this nuke, if I have this nuke in my yard, I can take this nuke and reintroduce it back to my full-size colony. I had, I'm being, um, I'm, I'm trying having all my resources on hand. I don't have to call a dealer and ask for a queen. I don't have to do anything else. I have all my resources and I'm being sustainable by having everything in myself. If you turn on lose a queen, then you have to call people like myself or all the queen rears out through Ohio, you have to get on a list if they haven't sold out already. And then you have to do a lot of other things. Be on your own timetable to where you don't have to run around, you don't have the expense of it and have your own nuke. Some other things on it, you can increase your apiary. So now I can make a split like this and I can have more hives. Not everybody wants seven hives sitting around or 20 hives sitting around. So what they want to do is you could also, if you turn on it on your Ohio State registration with ODA, if you want to get into this kind of thing, turn on and off your apiary, off to, the, off to the right hand side, it says, do I want to sell queens or nukes? The county inspector will check your hives. And now I can sell each one of these nukes for the going price for us up here is $170. So now I can sell these nukes off to another new beekeeper or somebody else that wants to get up and, and get running. Um, you can supply your strength for weak colonies. If I have a weak colony and I have a busting hive that's a nuke, I can actually take this. And what can you do with that nuke if it gets too large or gets too big? Put on another box. Put on another box over the top of that and have a five over five over five. If she's really bro or going well, turn on, drop that into a 10 frame box and off and run into the race as you are. So nukes, when you sell a nuke from anybody or you make a nuke yourself, this is the best way to get about an 80, 95% chance that it's gonna survive. When we talk nukes, it's usually a five frame. There's also fours and threes, but I don't, I personally do not call them nukes because they're just, you can do that in a queen castle or other things. But in this five frame nuke, every hive that's been overwintered, so you see your beekeepers that have your hives from last year, that queen is gonna to wanna to swarm. If I wanna take that hive, I can take the old queen away, take three frames of brood, take a frame of honey and pollen, partially drawn comb, give them something to work on, and I can make up a nuke with the old queen. The old colony is actually going to re raise a new queen. She's gonna go out and, and do a maiden flight and you cut the suppression down of them wanting to go into swarm mode and do by nature of what they do. So you're taking the old queen away. I could actually take this five frame nuke then, have it inspected, 
and sell it and make another $170 back in my pocket. So as you've heard, is beekeeping cheap? Absolutely not. This is a way to put money back in your pocket, sell a quality nuke to somebody else in, have the genetics for Ohio in your own area, and help somebody else out. And like I said, if this nuke gets to be busting, all of a sudden you open it up and it's all six gaps are filled. The box is pouring out with bees. Just put on another box. Let them come up, same thing. Take that center frame of brood, put it up in the center up here, get them to come up and draw, start drawing this out. If you have tons of nukes sitting around, if you have one or two nukes and you have tons of frames of foundation, put the foundation in here and use this nuke as a resource to pull out your foundation. You could actually let it go two boxes tall, come up here and put a queen excluder and put some cut comb on the top and have them do cut comb for you. Put in um, uh, mason jars and have them put mason jars, have them pull comb out of a mason jar. You can put Ross rounds in the top. Or if you wanted to, you could actually trap pollen out of these little girls and get a, get a feeder, a, tra a pollen trap on the front. So this is a way to have it. If you're gonna try and do this later in the year, if it's a five over five over five, you can actually let them girls go right through winter time. I have it about 30 highs behind the house that are five over five over fives. They went through winter all by themselves. I just slam them together. And that's exactly what I have right, oh, excuse me, right here. So in the springtime, once I have five over fives, these, I think it was these three that were all together on top of each other. I raised other queens, put a queen in each one, split them down in the top of my telescoping cover, my traveling cover on this. I put a feeder. Now I turn on, just put her on, put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven nukes. And those are my ones that I can sell later, or I can use them for increases in my own apiary. So we've all seen queen cells. What can you do with that queen cell? Make another split. But remember, every time you're cutting down your hive and taking away these resources, you're taking away your honey production. You're taking away things that you want to do with it, but you're doing it to have another, another nuke. So we have a queen cell. I, I done an inspection on a full size hive, found another queen cell, put the queen cell on the center frame, put frames of brood around the outside, a frame of pollen, give them a little bit of honey. Guess what? Now I have another nuke. So then we've all seen, all the senior beekeepers here have seen queen cells. What if I want to buy a queen cell? I can turn on talk to the queen breeders. The queen breeders in your area sell queen cells. You can pick them up for seven, maybe $10, depending on the breeder. I can turn on put the cell in between, three frames of brood, frame of pollen, frame of honey. Now I have another nuke. Who's ever purchased a queen? If you want to turn on have some different genetics, you like the Carnolians or Cardovans or Italians, and you want to try something a little bit different, or you want to bring some different breeds of bees into your apiary or into your location, here's a way to do it. I can go out and purchase a queen. When you purchase the queen from somebody, take it home and have this already set up approximately 24 hours before. That way when you pick it up, don't put her in your pocket and put her on the counter and let her sit for a couple days. Take her, put her in this box, and then let them release her. So you're gonna do it with at least two frames of found or two frames of brood, frame of foundation to give them something to do, some pollen and some honey. You can also put feeders on this just like this over here on the up to the left, put a feeder on the top, stimulate them. Now I just brought in a Cardovan queen that I really like or VHS queen. Or again, another purchase cell. Depending on how much resources you have, but remember when you get into nukes, it is a time issue. The more the smaller the box, the more time you're gonna have into it. So time, money, and resources, and then see what you have. If you're retired and you have a little bit of money in your pocket, you wanna turn on raise some nukes up, you wanna resell them back to the club members or people in your area, that's a great time to turn on and make nukes. And analyze. This is the most important thing that I tell everybody as an inspector. Record everything you do. Make a journal, notepad, computer, recording. We all have cell phones that have, you can turn on do pictures with and review and ask questions. Everything you do, if you have accurate information and you talk to an inspector, you talk to your club president, secretary, or, or, or a mentor and say, this is what I'm seeing and I don't know why, don't be afraid to ask. 
I have a policy in my club and with people with me, there is a no dumb question policy because you don't know what you don't know until you ask a question and learn it. I am not a pro by far. I've been beekeeping for about 12 years now. I have Dwight Wilson to thank for that, but I still call him and I use, I use all my resources, Barb Bletcher. I ask senior beekeepers when I go out and travel and do talks, I use those resources, find the oldest gentleman at a bee club and ask him how long he's been beekeeping. If he's been beekeeping 20, 40, 20, 40 years, ask him why he does different things, ask questions, make notes, and that is gonna be your best resource to do any of this stuff. What I'm gonna do now is open it up for questions and answers, so I'm gonna unmute all. If you do have a lot of background noise in your area or in your house, please put yourself on mute. And we have tons of questions here. So I'm gonna look down through this real quick. Make sure I have a welcome slide. We're supposed to be on slides. Da, 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 da. Okay, slides. Okay, I do thank you for telling me about the slides and I, I apologize, I didn't look up the site and see this. Are you showing the welcome page work and go to? Okay, so am I recommending dirty splits? I do not like dirty splits for the fact that it's it, you're taking a chance. And a dirty split, for those of you that don't know, is actually taking a full-size colony, you're splitting, the, you're splitting the colony into two, so you're taking on a new bottom board, you're taking half the resources and you're starting that out. The old queen will still keep on going. The dirty split is you're just walking away and you're just hoping that a new queen will emerge She'll go out and take a mating flight, but what happens if she goes out to take a mating flight and a bird picks her off, or she gets hit by a car, or she just never comes back? Then what's gonna happen in that dirty split on that side of it is if you're not out there enough, the workers will actually get, there's the pheromone of the QMP actually suppresses that laying worker. If there's no queen there or virgin queen or running around, you're gonna have a laying worker situation and you're gonna have frame after frame of drones. So what I do, I try and try and hedge that bet that I'm going to put in a queen cell, a queen graft. Um, I graft Doolittle style. I want to try and hedge my bets that I guarantee that this thing's going to be at least 80%, 90% productive and that it's going to succeed. Um, getting a new package on Wednesday, going to be cold. Any precautions I should take? What? Have have all of your gear. That was a question from the Hall family. If you're getting your package, have all of your gear ready to go. That means your hive is ready, your frames are ready, everything's painted. When you bring that home from the time you pick it up, go straight home and put that put that package in. Put the queen in the center, just like we showed you. Let the bees ball up around her. Put a feeder directly above that colony in the jar feeder. Feed about eight to 10 holes in the top of that. And even if you want, have another one ready to go in your house. Put some um, plastic wrap over the top of it so you don't get ants or anything in it in the house because it draws ants. But when you go out, check that thing every two to three days. On the third day, you're going to Toronto want to make sure that queen has been released from that container. And then take the package. If you want to put it in the, the one, the first way I showed where you're going to take the entire queen, put her in and put the box in, let the bees kind of go over to her. That's one way, or you can actually shake them on top of the queen, let them cluster up around her, keep that feeder on top while it's cold, wet, and rainy for these next few days. Make sure she has feed on top. That third day, make sure she gets out of that queen, that queen cage. Take a toothpick or a pen, a grafting tool. I have grafting tools in my pocket pop that rest of that candy out. Don't shake that container to shake her out. Put it on top. A few workers might run inside with her. Give her a little bit of time to come out. You can turn around, put it down, shake it softly. I mean, if it's five, 10 minutes, shake it a little bit and try to get her out. But once she crawls down inside, close it back up, put that empty box on top, put that feed on top, and then that's your best way to get. If you put on a front feeder, the bees will not break cluster and come out to that front entrance. I've seen too many times where people get tons and tons of, of packages. They put Boardman feeders on the front. Then they call Dwayne Hathaway, that, that, the dealer that, who in our area. And then he calls me looking for a queen because the colony got broke apart or they just freezed and died. So the best way to do that is to put feed on top and then wait till roughly, if you're watching the AccuWeather, roughly two weeks out, 
we're going to be full blown into season with swarm cells and swarm colonies and primary swarms. Um, do you have recommendations for a super box if you wanted to do cut comb on a nuke? I do that quite a bit on a cut comb. What I do is I let the colony get the primary, the primary nuke get built up, put it into a five over five. And then what I do is I take a queen or a queen excluder, the plastic ones, I cut it down to you 50 whole family. <laughs> oh. Just one second. Okay. So, okay. Whoever has the noise in the background, if you could please mute your mic. Thank you. So what to do is take your five over five. You can use a plastic. If you decide to cut the metal, that is your choice. But I use a plastic queen excluder on top. Take your frames and use thin set foundation. And the thin set foundation is just, it's used for cut comb. Put it in your frame, cut up, take that um, wax foundation and cut it in half. So it's hanging from the top bar. And when I say that, you're gonna turn around and take the slotted, slotted type frame, put that foundation inside, take a little bit of warm wax, melt it inside so it's just hanging. It's the Michael Palmer method. If you go on YouTube, type in Michael Palmer, cut comb production and what he has he has a whole production setup of how he turn hangs the wax from it that way it hangs down nice and straight in a in a, in a five over five found a five over five nuke that's powered up you can draw out some beautiful cut comb on the top um we checked our bees last weekend found around 20 be beetles in our hive we replaced the hive beetle trap and filled with new vegetable oil. Is there anything more we can do? Oh, I feel sorry for you, Tracy. Um, the best thing to do is put in your beetle jails, your beetle traps. Um, some of them that overwintered and everybody thinks that the hive beetles disappear over the winter time. What happens is the colony, they live on the peripheral or the outside edge of the colony over the winter time. Since we did not have a hard winter, I'm seeing this in my hives also. We already put in the microfiber across the end bars. I put in the beetle jails, the beetle traps. If the beetles get out of control for you, keep that front entrance down and keep a strong colony. That is the best, the best advice I can tell you. Um, I've also, last year, the beetles got out of hand for me just a little bit. I also use the py pyrethroid. It's the ground soak that you actually mix up. It's roughly 1.5 ounces that they sell in Man Lake or Dayton. You mix it with a gallon of hot water and you shake it up and you spray the ground at night. So you're to run and actually, so if those larvae get in the ground and pupate, I don't have mature females that are coming back out and getting inside my hive. So it's a way to turn on and cut them down. I wish there was a solid method of getting rid of hive beetles, but I think this year because, and this is my own opinion, because we did not have a harsh winter, I think hive beetles are going to become a problem this year. But if all else, in each layer of your colony, so from the bottom all the way to the top, on your outside edges, Tehran, put in some beetle jails. Put beetle jails in each box all the way up. But please remember, when you're putting in your vegetable oil and doing that kind of thing, when you do a hive inspection, make sure you take the hive beetle traps with vegetable oil out first before you tilt that box. Because if you have the oil or vegetable oil in those traps and you take that top box and you tilt it up and that vegetable oil pours down inside, it's just going to kill everything that it touches all the way down through. So you're killing the brood. If the queen's below it, you're killing the queen and everything else. Wow. And it makes a slimy mess throughout your hive. Mm -hmm. um, another question from Greg. My three overwintered colonies are all packed, are all packed with bees and honey, brood and pollen. Not much room for the queen to lay, honey bound, lots of nectar and pollen coming in last week. So I added a super to each, but did not provide feed because I wanted them to use the honey in the lower boxes to make the space for the queen to lay. Thoughts, is this a different approach you would take? I can do, I can, I plan to, plan to split when it gets warmer. In this condition, because we have this cold front coming through for two weeks, I would do exactly what you've done. Give them extra room. Don't break up the brood area. So if you're going to run, open up a box, mm -hmm. try to find out where the colony's at. If it's in just in one box, give them area. Or if you have drone comb, 
put drawn comb directly above them. If it's all foundation, put foundation directly above them. Give them some room to take yeah. that compression that That's they're amazing. feeling right now and able to get out and able to turn around, stretch out a little bit and draw out some resources for you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. what, what you done, I would, that's exactly what I would do. Thank if you. you're going to turn on and if you can get a hold of some queens, if you can get some queens yeah. right now, then you turn on and do some splits after that. But right now, it's it, for anybody who's grafting, there's a few people up our area that have grafted. So there's not an abundance of queens coming out right now, especially mated queens. So you're in a little bit of a catch-22. But you've done a good job. Um, Susan, when you put the sugar water on, or put sugar water on, just put over the inner cover slot. So afraid with the cold weather coming, it won't get wet and, and die. What about putting uh, probably a board? Susan, is that a boardman feeder? Yes. And on Can the inner cover. Me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was saying, I'm afraid that when I put the jar on the inner cover, that it'll drip down with this cold weather and get them wet and they'll die. No, what you're going to do with that jar, when you tighten that jar up, flip that jar before you put it over the colony, flip that jar over and hold it in your hand. Okay. So what you're going to do is that you're going to see that vacuum and with that little bit of head space or that air space that's going to pour out very quick and then it's going to taper down and it's going to stop. If it continues to pour, then tighten that seal up a little bit tighter. That means it's getting air in or burping in air or and please, for everybody on this, if you're beating the holes in that lid, remember what the size of the tongue of a bee is. It's about the size of the tip of a needle. You don't need a 16-penny nail making these big, gigantic holes because it'll never draw a vacuum at that point. So take your container, either the pickle jar, quart, pint, flip it over. And when you flip it over, make sure it pours just a little bit and then stops. And then put it over the center and you'll be, you'll be fine. The times I've ever gotten into trouble is when I tighten it, I just flip it over, put it on, and then I come back the next day and go, wow, they drank a whole entire gallon of, of sugar water. They didn't. It poured down through the center, killed the colony, made a slimy mess, and, and then, and, and it's my own fault. I mean, you can't say anybody else did it. It's your own fault at that point. Hey, Jamie. Yes, ma'am. Could you put the boardman feeder, the actual plastic part on top of that, or just don't even waste your time? And, and you could, you could, because the top, the fact that you still have it on the top, you have an extra deep or a shallow or a medium on top of it, and it's covered and it's condensed up. Some people, I've seen some people take chicken waterers and put them in the top. Remember, all that extra heat's come into the top, it's warming it up so they can get up there and feed and go back down. The only reason I like it, I like it better is because they don't have to climb up into the box, because if it gets too cold, all they have to do is go up to the bottom of that inner cover, drink, and come right back down. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, a question from Mike. Do you agree with many of the Carnolians are more suited for Ohio climate than Italian bees? Oh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, give you a, I'm going to plead the fifth. Um, I'm going to say Ohio mutts do better in Ohio. That means they were raised in Ohio, they were bred in Ohio, they were um, my overwintered queens. And when anybody that's doing queen rearing, they're taking their best stock, best stock of that they're not aggressive, the best stock that they, not, they walk around in the frames and do a good honey production, that they have good genetics, they don't have chalk brood problems, they don't have dysentery and things like that. And then I'm breeding from my best stock that I like that has survived, um, has the best VH, VHS traits. And then I'm breeding from that. I cannot say that anybody says they have 100% Carnolians, Italians, or Russians, because I don't, I, I, I've never bought bees in probably the last eight years. I do bring in bees if I, if I want better genetics or to add to my genetic pool, because I don't want to get it tied up. I'll bring in um, bees from Nina, Bagley in, in Germantown. Um, Danny Slayball over in Indiana. Um, I've got some bees. Um, I do. I do some grafting at Purdue College, or Bur excuse me, Purdue University, to get in some other traits that I'm looking for. But I can't say. And and and, and if there's any other senior beekeepers that want to chime in on this, if 
but I can't say because I've heard people that say that Buckfast are the best, Garnolians are the best, Italians are the best. So I don't want to put my name with a label that says this is what I like the best and mine are mutts. I mean, I have everything from look, they look like Italians, um, Carnolian, some of them have stripes. It, it just depends. But the best ones are the ones that are bred and made and processed here in, 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 in Ohio. Um, from Key, who should we see to buy nukes or packages? I have a top bar hive with a feeder. Talk to your club or your club representative in your area. If all else, reach out to OSBA and we can try to help you find out the local dealers in your area and, and see, who, see who sells nukes or packages. I'm not familiar with anything below probably Van Wert. I know most of the dealers from there all the way up and all the way over. So I can't tell you in your area, but shoot me an email and I can help you out with OSBA and we can see if we can find somebody, some reputable dealers in your area. Um, as Steve, far right. as um, go ahead. Jamie, this is Mary Zabalski. As far as the Queens, um, free is best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, free, free and, is definitely um, best. Free is definitely best, and I found that the mutts are the best, and the ones that are raised around here are the best, um, the overwintered ones. So, you know, it doesn't, I don't think um, any particular breed is the best. It's just the overwintered ones. Yep. You know, well, if, well, if, I they did, still, if, if they didn't overwinter, I don't want to breed from them anyhow. Yeah, I don't want to either. The one, I still have my one, one of the ones that you gave me my first year that um, that you gave me my first nuke. And that's what, it's going on three years now. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm still, she's still going at it. And I just Good. checked her last week. So, and she's still going. All right. So, Thank you for your input. Yeah. Okay, we got a question from Mark or Keith Mark, Keith March, excuse me. Who should we buy? Okay, so I'm, right, I'm sorry, I already got to his. Steve Draco, for a new nuke, is it advisable? Is it is is it advisable to immediately treat with one half of hot guard? If not, what is the what time frame would you first alcohol wash? And it's an eight frame. I would not treat just to treat. Um, even using hop guard or using anything else. If your bees are turned and, and they're probably, you had them from a nuke dealer or a breeder, they should have already treated to get to that point. Not saying to go out and instantly kill 300 of your bees in, in a nuke. Let them build up a little bit. I would shoot for June 1st or the end of May, depending on when you want to do it. Just make it consistent every month that when you do that alcohol wash. And remember, take take the frame of open brood, and then you're going to try and take that frame. You're going to check for that queen at least three times. If you got a buddy with you or someone that helps you, let them check that frame also. The queen does not lay eggs, and she's not real productive after she has an alcohol wash. So to run and double check, knock those bees off into a container. Take a half a cup of bees, do your alcohol wash, and that's going to your first alcohol wash. It's going to give you your baseline. And then from there, you'll see that, uh, that gradual escalation of, of mites. Um, Susan, would it be better to do your splits after spring honey flow, also queen rearing, or have a few hives to split and do queen rearing with? Once we get into the nectar flow, that's the time that these bees are building up and they know that they want to swarm. So once the nectar flow starts in your area, I'm going to say after this cold shot comes through, you're going to turn on it. You can start doing splits. You can start doing OTS, start doing some grafting. Um, the couple gentlemen that have grafted up my way, um, probably 50%, 40% success. They still got some nice queen cells out of it, but this cold snap's coming through. So it's kind of slowed things down. But once we warm back up, the honey flow or the nectar flow, excuse me, starts to kick in. Go ahead and start raising a couple queens. Get some JBZs if you want to do OTS. Mel's method works really well too. Just depends on your skill set and practice. Just practice. Go out. If you don't succeed, go around and put things back up, make another cell builder and practice again. And even if you get one queen, you just saved yourself $40 and you've just made a split for yourself. 
Hey, Jamie. Yes, ma'am. Um, with that being said, though, if you start um, making queen cells and stuff, that won't lower the honey production in that hive. Now, what you're going to do, if you're going to do that, if you're going to make a cell starter, remember, every time you're doing splits or raising queens, those are resources that would have got you honey. Okay. So that's let's, just, let's, just say, let's just say you had two hives. Okay. Some, people, some people can take your colonies. I'm going to let one make honey, and I'm going to use the other one and start making queen cells and start raising some nukes out of. Gotcha. What, you, what you're going to do, you're going to split your resources up so you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. And so if you say you raise three queens, take one of those queens, sell that queen, make $40 from it, a mated queen, and have three or four nukes or have a queen castle. And for those of you who don't know, a queen castle is that same deep that you see, but it has partitions in the center, either a two, 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 and two. So it has two, it has four queens inside. So four small colonies, or it has three, three, and three. So it has three colonies and each one goes out a different direction. So it's only one box that it has multiple ports where they can come in and out and you can turn on and put in a virgin queen. And if she doesn't make it back, you can just turn on and combine those two that did survive or the, did, the queen that really come back and really showed off. But it takes resources to do that. Remember, every time you're taking a frame of brood away from a colony or taking stuff away, your honey production is slowing down. So kind of play things around. If you want three hives, let two of them be honey and another one for something else. Okay, thank you. Um, from Keith, is cedar wood good for a hive? Um, I myself do not have the experience with cedar, so I don't want to comment on this one. Um, I do know people that make nukes and make hives out of cedar. Um, I've never seen any pros and cons to it. There's a gentleman, um, Andrew Carlin, that's right above me, who's making tons of nukes out of cedar, out of the cedar um, dog ear planks from Menards. And he's making up tons of nukes. And he thinks his, his psychology behind it is that it might drive away the wax moth and to keep out the hive beetle. I don't, I, there's no scientific thing that I've read on it, but it might work if there's anything else. I mean, if it really does succeed this year, because we've seen so many hive beetle already, I will turn around and make a publication of it or write something up about it. It's not science, it's backyard science three or backyard science something. But I, I have no proof of that. And again, if any other senior beekeeper or a more experienced beekeeper says that they, they like cedar and it does something well, please chime in or add something in and we'll bring it up in the next meeting. Okay, we have no other questions at this point. And I'll give you one last chance here to turn on, add in some... Um, I'm launching a poll right now. And this is the overall. Was the live webinar training class will helpful to you? And you could answer. Absolutely. What other live webinar training classes would you like to see in the future? That's a multiple choice. Would you like to see this type of training continue from OSBA? Because right now we're talking about doing this just for a little bit. Um, this would be good information that I can take back to the board on next Sunday. And um, uh, Peggy asked me, the president of OSBA asked me if you were a member of OSBA. So we have roughly almost 90 some odd people participating. So it'd be some good information that I can take back to the board. And I would like to take your choices back to everybody. Jamie? Um, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish. I wanted to ask one more question. Nope, not a problem. So if there's any other, if there's any other questions, please put that in. Please take a few seconds to fill that back out. Um, we do have the information that's gonna come out just like for Dave Noble's talk on the 26th, an hour before the talk, so approximately at six o'clock. Um, we do have 64 people signed up for that class. There might not be, right now, I'm, I'm just gonna go on the, the accurate information for right now, so we have 100 slots available. If we turn on talk to OSBA, I'm gonna take this survey back to them when we have our meeting. If, we, if not, we're gonna try and open up that license to 500 people. So we'll have plenty of slots, but Dave's is still on the OSBA website. So you can go there and turn on and get that information. If you wanna turn on and listen to him next week, it'll be, on the same lines. it'll be on the same lines that we have this week. 
Um, Dave will be answering, given his presentation. We'll have a little bit of housekeeping in the middle, in the beginning. Dave will present, we'll have some Q&A in the end. And then by next Sunday, this webinar that we're having now will be posted on the OSBA website. So if you go to YouTube and type in OSBA website or Ohio State Beekeepers Association, you can subscribe and hit the bell. So as soon as we upload it, it'll turn on and give you a notification that there has been a new video uploaded. You can share it, you can turn on and send it to friends and go through this whole entire webinar again. Um, next month, by the time this comes around, we're gonna change things up just a little bit. Um, I had some feedback, which was very constructive. A lot of people, we still have a lot of people in OSBA that are not techie as far as cell phones and links and this and that. So by next month, by, by the time Dave's talk at the end of the month, you can still go to the website for, for Facebook or Ohio State Beekeepers on Facebook, like the page, share it. You can still reserve your spot on that webinar for Dave coming up on the April 26th at seven o'clock. I'm also gonna make it available to reserve your spot by emailing the editor, E-D-I-T-O-R at ohiostatebeekeepers.com or .org. So you can send an email to me and I will turn on and save enough positions back that people on the phone, the older generation that just wants to pick up the cell phone or the landline and turn on and still listen to this. So I don't want it to run and keep it just one section. I want everybody to be able to get some education out of this. Um, we had a couple more questions come in. Uh, thank you very much for the, thank you, Jamie, good job. Thank you very much for the comments. Um, thoughts and advice on an observation hive for a newbie. Um, I have an observation hive that I've kept in my bedroom for six, six seven years now. Um, it has a inch and a half clear line that goes out the window. This is something that is fun to watch. My granddaughter will sit and watch it for four or five hours. I can close it up, take the line off, and actually take it to school events and show kids and things like that. It is a fun thing to play with. The problem is, is they build up very quickly in that observation hive. So it's, it, it will be something that you'll have to take apart, close the line off, take it outside, cut the, um, cut the resources down, take out frames of brood, give it to another nuke, and to um, put in frames of foundation all the time because they, they are a full colony and well, they wanna be a full colony. So they're constantly gonna pull in tons and tons of resources. And if all else, I mean, you can turn, let it go, just let her swarm. Maybe, maybe you'll catch a swarm, maybe not. And then just let them have a new queen and let them start all over again. But you still need to pull it apart, check for diseases, check for things like that, hive beetle, wax moth, and make sure that you, you give them the resources that they, they deserve. Um, from Ty, when would you reverse boxes on overwintered hives? Next week, I would start after this cold front comes through because the overnight, if you reverse right now, if, and, and two things, if you have a solid bottom board, that means there's no screen to it, it's a solid. If you have a solid bottom board, you could probably do this next week. Take that, find that queen where she's at and that brood and rotate that to a new bottom board. If it's between two boxes, so you crack it open and you find half the broods in the top, half the broods in the bottom, Take both of those boxes, do not split them up. Take both of those boxes, put it on a new bottom board, rotate her down, take that empty comb that would be on the bottom of the old colony or the old stack and put that on top. That's all drawn, she'll go up there and lay, she'll build up real nice. If, you, if she's a small colony or it's gonna still be cold, wet and rainy and you look on AccuWeather for five days and it's gonna be nasty, don't be afraid of putting on a one-to-one -one sugar water on the top and stimulate it a little bit and give them a kick. Um, from Gail, thank you for your time and blessings, Yoda. Yeah, thank you very much. Yoda. <laughs> um, if there's no other questions, we're going to go ahead and close out tonight. I want to thank everybody on, on part of OSBA and myself for participating. I hope you enjoyed this seminar. And from the looks of it, absolutely, we are going to turn around and take this information to OSBA board. Um, thank you for your feedback, swarm, swarm trapping, um, summer hive management. Would you like to see this? 100% of you said yes. Thank you very much. And are you a member? So those of you that are not a member of OSBA, 
don't be afraid of getting into the quarterly newsletter. There's the application in the back of the, of the newsletter that you can fill out. The $20 does go for programs like this and it helps out OSBA to put on programs for the 4-H and other things that go on. So please, if you think, it, you, think you want to try and be a member, if you got the bug and it stung you and, and you love beekeeping, just join for the life membership. So, um, Tracy Dutner, any other questions coming through? Thanks for your time and wisdom. Thank you very much for the comments. Look forward to the next one. Thank you much, everybody.